Um, today we have a talk by Gianfranco Bettone. Of course, we all know Gianfranco as our neighbor, so to speak, from the other side of, of um, the, uh, the street. And uh, behind the, the, all the new buildings, there's the old UFA building where he's uh, having his office with his group, the Grappa group, um, which is, I think, a really interesting uh, uh, gathering of talents. Uh, Gianfranco will be talking today about his uh, new book, Tussen uh, Twee Oneindigheden, or as it's uh, called in English, at least, Between Two Infinities. Um, and I'm not quite sure what it's called in Italian, but he can tell you. Um, Gianfranco uh, will be speaking in English today. Um, his book is available in English as well, but um, if you read Dutch, uh, there's a Dutch uh, version uh, published quite recently by a uh, new scientist, Nederland. And uh, I read the book. I think it's excellent. So let's see what the talk does, but uh, let's give the floor to Gianfranco now. If you're ready, hey. Gianfranco, go ahead. Thanks, Martin. Thanks a lot for the introduction and for the invitation to speak at the uh, NICAF uh, launch meetings. Um, I've, uh, since this is a public, uh, an, an outreach um, uh, exercise, um, I've uh, decided today to give the talk um, for a very broad audience. Uh, Martin gave me uh, instructions not to put too many technical details. So what I've done is I removed technical details uh, from the talk. And um, I hope uh, this will still be interesting for the experts uh, who are connected today. Uh, be happy, of course, to stay to stick around after the presentation. That I aim to uh, should should last probably around forty five minutes uh, to discuss uh, things a bit more in depth. But maybe that's also a good exercise for us to discuss how uh, you know for the experts uh, who are connected to discuss how we talk about the the universe, its contents, and what we do to a general audience. So I would also appreciate feedback on that beside the discussions on technical details. Uh, so as Martin told you, you know, this is um, a book that I originally wrote in Italian. And for, if you're curious, Martin, the title in Italian sounds Sospesi tra due infiniti, which literally means uh, suspended between two infinities. So we just skipped the, the suspended in the Dutch, uh, in the Dutch version uh, for, because the, sound, the title sounded a bit better like this, um, apparently. Um, so, um, then it was translated to English. The English version will be published in a couple of weeks. And uh, the Dutch version was published just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so this is very, very fresh. Now, I would like to start this uh, <coughs> presentation <coughs> from, uh, let me, please let me, uh, tell me if you see the second slide. Do you see a slide with an astronaut on it? No. No, okay. No, so, no. Not yet. Okay, so let me try something else. We had this problem with Martin a few minutes ago, but I think we know how to solve it. Should be. We decided to uh, that you would switch off your own video. No, no, I, th I think it's uh, it's easier than that. Hopefully, it's easier than that. Uh, can you see the astronaut now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, I would like to start this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, with uh, uh, something that the astronaut Charlie Duke, uh, who was aboard the Apollo 16, said in 1972. Uh, he said uh, uh, he was just coming back from a walk uh, on the uh, surface of the moon, and he said that uh, moon dust tastes like gunpowder. And this really struck me when I uh, read this, uh, this sentence. There are similar um, uh, comments uh, that were made by other astronauts. Buzz Aldrin also said that the moon smells like wet ashes, like when you drop water uh, on Europe to extinguish a fire. Uh, there was the smell uh, that was evoked uh, by uh, the, the smell of uh, moon dust. And this really struck me when I read about these uh, um, experiences uh, made by these, uh, uh, these astronauts, because it struck me that we, if, you, if you think about it, uh, when we perceive the universe around us, uh, we use, as you know, five senses, uh, you know, taste, sight, touch, smell, and, and hearing. But, and, and this is how we really interact with anything around us. But if you think carefully, we only use 
sites uh, to know the universe. Everything be which is beside, beyond like a few meters uh, from, uh, uh, from us, we really use sight only uh, to see it. And certainly this applies to all astronomical objects. This is a less obvious, uh, I think, le less trivial uh, than it may sound uh, in the sense that, you know, it, it is certainly true that eyes are organs that were evolved in, in the history of, uh, of evolution of, of, spe of all species uh, to analyze, uh, to receive and analyze the, the type of electromagnetic radiation, which is most abundant around us, which is the one provided by our own star, uh, the sun. And it's, it's certainly not surprising if you start from uh, you know, simple photoreceptive cells, um, you know, people who study these for the, these things for a living will tell you that eventually, with uh, the the rate of mutations that are expected uh, thanks to evolution, you will form eventually um, eyes. You can uh, form eyes, and this actually probably happened a number of times in a number of independent evolutionary lines in the history of uh, of evolution. It's also true, however, that it's it's only sorry. It's only um, because we live on a planet from which we, on the surface of a planet uh, that gives direct access uh, to the light that comes from stars, that we can actually see them. And it's not difficult, you know, you don't have to uh, use too much uh, uh, imagination uh, to figure out situations in which, the, in which this would not be possible. Uh, there is this beautiful novel called. Um, um, Nightfall uh, by Asimov, where he imagines a, a planet uh, surrounded by many stars, where it's always there's always daylight and nobody has ever seen nobody on that planet has ever seen the stars. Uh, you can imagine also forms of life that develop under the icy surface of a planet, like this would be on the, the oceans on Europa or under a thick layer of clouds as it would be on, on Venus. So in a sense, we are very lucky uh, to have these, uh, these to, to have been able to develop these organs that can collect uh, the, the light of stars, but also to have stars easily accessible to us without um, building uh, any particularly complicated devices. And it's actually that studying uh, stars with a naked eye uh, that we could, uh, uh, know the, the universe. Uh, there are many, um, mod, well, throughout the history of, uh, of mankind, we've seen, we know that people have looked at stars, they've uh, built, they've aligned their buildings uh, to stars. Uh, I'm just coming back from um, an event in, um, in Italy where there were some experts who were basically were walking around um, and exploring different sites in Sicily and other regions in the south of, of Italy. And they found many, many uh, alignments. Uh, so either monuments that were built in a, in a way to be aligned with astronomical events, but also simple, almost, you know, devices to measure um, time, rudimental devices to measure time or to measure a period of the year uh, using the holes in, um, in rocks and things like that. So this is what we've done since the dawn of humanity, really measuring, using, uh, watching the stars and using them for a variety of practical purposes. Now, we figured out gravity also with the naked eye, but the history that the last 100, so then, then with starting from Galileo, we started to build uh, telescopes, which are sort of artificial eyes and become more and more precise, give us, give us access to the deep uh, cosmos, the deep universe. And the history of astrophysics in the last 100 years could be uh, told as uh, uh, basically a, 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 the discovery of all the, the colors of the universe that cannot be seen with human eyes. So if you go to frequencies that are way below uh, the visible light or way above uh, visible light, uh, now we, we know very well, and you know, at Science Particle Active on, on many, well, virtually on all different tiers. Uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, from radio waves all the way to, uh, to gamma rays. 
And this is, you know, there is a fundamental limitation if you go below radio waves, um, you know, if you have wavelengths that are longer than a you know, few tens of meters, uh, then the radiation that comes from the universe is, you know, bounces off uh, the, the atmosphere. So, you know, we're, uh, we're limited uh, in, the, in the range of frequencies from below uh, because of that reason. And as many of you know, if you go to very, very large uh, energies, to, to energies of gamma rays way beyond, uh, the TV, then the universe uh, becomes opaque. Uh, the universe itself uh, becomes opaque. Uh, these gamma rays can interact with uh, other forms of radiation for the experts uh, who are connected here. They can interact with other photons of the cosmic microwave background, the pair production and be, and be absorbed. So we have a horizon, uh, an energy dependent horizon uh, also in the higher, higher energies. Now, uh, thanks to these, uh, uh, to this to visible light and all these different colors of the universe, uh, we were able to discover a lot. Uh, we've been this, we discovered a lot of amazing astrophysical uh, objects and cosmological objects. We figured out uh, a lot about the, the history of the universe, the origin, its evolution, its structure. But we also had to face a number of uh, uh, mysteries uh, of uh, unexpected uh, mysteries, uh, things like dark matter, this mysterious form of matter that seems to permeate the universe, dark energy that seems to a form of energy, possibly a form of energy that seems to push uh, the uh, acceleration, uh, the, the expansion of the universe, make it accelerate ever faster. And then the so-called singularities are sometimes they refer to as like such as black holes and uh, the very origin of the universe, um, the, which is commonly referred to as the, as the Big Bang. We learned a lot about these, uh, all these different uh, frontiers of, of research, but they're really uh, you know, at different levels and shrouded in a, in a cloud of, of mystery. And uh, the, the book uh, is really about how these mysteries, that we'll, as I will argue in a, in a moment, they connect the infinitely large and the infinitely small. And that's why the book is called uh, Between Two Infinities. And um, the, the specific point I tried to make uh, in the book is that the discovery of gravitational waves, uh, and people at Nikkei are, of course, uh, very much uh, aware of the discovery that actually contributed significantly uh, to the, uh, the discovery, uh, the first direct detection of gravitational waves uh, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2017. Uh, the book, as I was saying, is about how this discovery of gravitational waves, this first direct detect uh, detection of gravitational waves, can help us establish these connections between infinitely large and infinitely small. So they provide us, the, connecting to what I was saying earlier, they really provide us as a, a, a new way to perceive the universe. It's a new sense that humanity has uh, developed uh, to know, uh, to perceive and to study and to understand the universe beyond sight. So the, the big questions uh, they would like to uh, discuss uh, today is how big uh, is the universe? Uh, I will show you a, um, a way uh, that um, I started to use to convey the size of, uh, of the universe that maybe would be interesting to some of you. Maybe you can reuse it in one of your uh, public talks. And for those of you, if there are people who are not, uh, not experts, uh, maybe this will help us, help them visualize uh, the, some of the concepts that we'll be discussing today. Then I will ask, what is the universe made of? Uh, what remains to be discovered, and then I will conclude with a consideration about what is our place in the universe. Now, to use, as I was saying, as a uh, as a narrative device uh, to describe how big is the universe, I borrowed the the um, uh, classical um, as a, a cosmos arranged in nine spheres. And uh, some of you might, um, might be uh, familiar with uh, this. Is my voice breaking, Martin? Yeah, it was a bit, but it's OK now. OK. Um, so uh, the universe arranged in, um, in nine spheres. 
some of you, well, all of you are certainly familiar with uh, this classical description of, uh, of the universe, uh, the, West, the, way the, the, the spheres that he get into the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So basically the five known planets plus the sun and the moon. Uh, then there was the, um, the sphere of fixed stars, as they were called. And then an external uh, sphere uh, that was basically generating the movement of all the uh, of all the other spheres, the so-called primum mobile, as it was called in um, in the antiquity. Now, of course, in, in modern uh, cosmology, it wouldn't make any sense uh, to devote one sphere to one particular um, to one particular astrophysical object. But we what we can do, and I think it helps in visualizing distances in the universe way more than saying you know, billions and billions of, of meters to describe the, the size of a galaxy, for example. Um, the idea is to, to use this device of uh, nine concentric spheres and to use for, um, to associate to each sphere and actually a physical sphere of a given radius. And every time you jump from one sphere to the next, you jump in radius by exactly a factor of a thousand. So if you look at, at the Earth and uh, look around us, so if you draw uh, uh, a sphere, uh, you, you look at everything in the radius between one and a thousand meters around the surface of the Earth. Uh, this is what you one could uh, uh, refer to as the, uh, the sphere of humans. Um, more than 90% of humans lived in the, live in this very thin shell around, um, around our own planet. Uh, there's only a, a small fraction of, uh, of the human population that lives at altitudes above 1,000 meters. Now, if you go to the second sphere, instead of jumping by a factor of two, let's jump, logar we, we go logarithmically, so we go up by a sphere, uh, to a sphere of um, um, one million meters. And all of a sudden, you start to encompass uh, all the satellites that floats, well, millions of uh, artificial objects that floats around, um, that float around the Earth. You make another jump, and um, and you, you start immediately to see the power of this uh, uh, logarithmic um, progression. Well, most of you, of course, are familiar with this, but I, I think it. it helps uh, to keep the nine the number of spheres small enough to be easily manageable uh, in the head of people who are not being exposed uh, to these type of concepts. When you jump to the sphere of one billion meters now, um, 10 to the nine meters, you encompass the orbit of the moon. And, um, and actually instead of the, uh, of, of this kind of simplified drawing of the earth and the moon, I think it's very effective to show actually the, an actual photo uh, snapped, uh, taken by uh, one, uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, NASA, NASA spacecraft, I think it was Iris, the Iris spacecraft, who took actually a photo of the system earth that you see at the, at the center of the image and the moon, you know, this tiny, uh, spec uh, here that you see um, at the bottom right corner of your screen uh, that it merely gives you a, um, a clear idea of the relative size of the earth moon system the relative uh, distance and the fact that it's it's so empty uh, out there now we can go uh, we can jump another uh, by a factor of uh, a thousand again we're in sphere number four and you get to encompass all the inner planets uh, of the solar system. And uh, you also start to notice at this scale, uh, an effect which is uh, crucial to understand all astronomical images, which is the fact that because of the finite uh, speed of lights, things that, um, when we look at things that are far away uh, in the sky, uh, these, these, we, we look at these objects as they are, as they were in a distant past. And I encourage you to, uh, for those of you who, are not, who have not done that yet, I encourage you to look at these animations that this um, uh, researcher has produced uh, that visualize the speed of lights uh, 
um, in a real time, so to say, as it bounces uh, through um, different uh, systems around the Earth, from the, in the Earth-Moon system, all the way to Mars, and they from the Sun. And all of a sudden, you see that the speed of light that we always refer to as uh, you know, incredibly fast and almost instantaneous, you see how slow light is on astronomical scales, or alternatively, how, how large astronomical scales are. You jump to sphere number five, and you reach out uh, to the outer edge of the solar system. Uh, and basically, you encompass everything that was ever created by humans, including the Voyager uh, spacecrafts, you now have um, um, went beyond uh, the, the Helio Pass and uh, into open space, outer space, uh, so to say. Jump again, we already appear six out of nine uh, in these uh, uh, series of jumps. At sphere number six, the jump is, is quite spectacular because then you go from, uh, the, from what's really, uh, in a way, familiar uh, to, to most of us, uh, which is what we study at school, you know, the solar system and the planets and the sun and things like that. We include thousands of stars, okay? We are in the field of stars of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and we encompass thousands of stars. And among these stars, there are stars like our own sun. And in fact, most of the stars we believe are, um, uh, have, uh, uh, are surrounded by, by planets. We already know more than 4,000 planets uh, around other stars. And then we have stars that are more compact uh, than the, that are larger than the suns, like the, the giants. Uh, that are more compact than the sun, like the white dwarfs and all the way to, to stars that are as big as cities, you know, like neutral stars or the size of Amsterdam, so to say, a, city, a relatively a mid-sized city like Amsterdam. And we then encounter on these scales, uh, also these uh, mysterious objects uh, that remain mysterious despite all the technological advances that we made and the spectacular advances uh, that we made in the, uh, since uh, they, they were first postulated. And, um, and studied, uh, the name was coined in uh, probably end of the 60s, beginning of the uh, 90, uh, 70s, sorry. Um, there are black holes. And uh, for a long time, we had to resort to this kind of pictorial, um, to the artist impressions of, uh, of black holes. Now we have actual snapshots of, uh, of black holes. It's, it's quite important to explain quite carefully to a, a, a general audience uh, what these uh, images are and what they represent in what sense uh, they are images of, uh, of black holes. I'm not sure there are many people who are not familiar with these type of images. If there are and they want to know more, uh, feel free to ask questions about it. But so we're starting to, to uh, face some of the, of the mysteries, of the mysterious aspects of the universe out there. Uh, we're at sphere six, we're encountering these mysterious objects, black holes. As we go, go up on uh, sphere number seven, seven of nine, uh, we encompass the whole Milky Way, the galaxy we live in, disk of stars and stars uh, surrounded, rotating around a common center. And at this scale, there's another mystery that becomes apparent, which is the, the mystery of uh, the missing mass or the dark matter. Uh, if you had asked uh, an astronomer what, the, what a galaxy, our galaxy or any galaxy looks like um, until the 1970s, they would have shown you an image like this. When we think about a galaxy today, we think about a disk of stars and gas, which is embedded in a way larger distribution of dark, matter, okay? This is the standard cosmological model. We don't, <coughs> we don't see <coughs> this distribution of mass that you see in this, in this image. This is the result of numerical simulations, but numerical simulations actually uh, produce um, a distribution of mass, uh, which is actually in perfect agreement with uh, the type of observation we perform on the scale of, um, on the scale of galaxies. Now, we would like, of course, to measure uh, this dark matter in our laboratories, even if the agreement is good, we would like to measure 
um, yeah, this, uh, this mysterious form of matter to observe it in our laboratory. And this is, of course, what many people at um, NICEF uh, and at the University of Amsterdam are busy, are busy doing, um, building experiments, underground experiments uh, to search for these, uh, for these particles, uh, searching for the, uh, these particles in, the, in, in accelerators. And, um, and with astronomical with astronomical searches. Now, the first Nobel Prize in, in um, uh, that in, in which dark matter was formally mentioned uh, as um, uh, as uh, um, a motivation uh, for the for the prize was the one awarded to uh, Jim Peebles uh, in 2019. And we always uh, we always uh, say that um, the dark matter. Uh, and dark energy, as that I will mention in a minute, make 95% of the universe out there. I want to go back to this particular point, 95%, uh, to qualify a bit more this, uh, this statement. I think we need to be a bit careful when we uh, present this uh, to the general public, because I think it can be quite confusing, as a matter of fact. Now, there are only two spheres left, and this tells you a lot about the relative size of what's out there in the universe. If we go to sphere number eight, we start to see the so-called cosmic web, uh, the network of filaments and, and voids and knots uh, that describe, that, that characterize um, the distribution of matter on very large scales in the universe. And it is on these scales that you see this, uh, this other mystery. So we've seen uh, the sphere number six, the mystery of black hole, the mystery, uh, sphere number seven, the mystery of dark matter. Now in sphere number eight, you see this other mystery, which is that it seems that the universe, as the universe expands, the expansion rate of the universe seems to be increasing with time, as if there was a, a new type of energy, a new type of force that is pushing uh, the universe and make it expand, expand ever faster. Uh, we've uh, dubbed this uh, mystery dark energy uh, in analogy with the concept of dark matter. But the truth is that we don't even know whether it's a form of uh, energy that is pushing the universe. We are just, we're, we're still very far from uh, an understanding, a true understanding of uh, the fundamental nature of dark energy. And I come back to what I was saying earlier. Um, this is a small digression, uh, but a point that I, I think it's, um, it's worth uh, discussing. Uh, we, when we discuss about the, when we talk about the universe, uh, we, always, we, we often hear that uh, the universe, we've discovered that 95% of the universe is dark. And I've always found this, uh, this statement a bit misleading, unless it's qualified uh, properly. The point, specific point I want to make is that, yes, it's true. It's um, uh, today and on very large scales, the universe is, uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, uh, at volume, a uh, very large volume, then you can make a statement about the relative proportion of these different species of uh, matter and energy in the universe. But if you look at different scales, so if you look, for example, on the scale, if you, if going back to this sphere one or two in our characterization or description of the cosmos, and you ask what is the universe is made of in, inside those spheres, well, those spheres are 100% made of atoms. You don't see the effect of dark matter uh, around the Earth. Uh, you don't see certainly the effect of, uh, of dark energy, which is even, even, uh, even more subdominant on these scales. If you draw a sphere around the galaxy, um, and you will find the exact numbers in this, in this paper here, for example, and ask what is the universe uh, made of inside this, this sphere, you will say that dark matter makes 72% of it, and atoms make 28% of it. And there's no trace of dark energy in the, in the relative proportion of these two species. If you draw a sphere on very, you know, if you look on very, 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 very large scales, on cosmological scales, which go sub, uh, substantially beyond the scale of classes of galaxies, then you recover this relative proportion, 72, 23, and, and five. So it's really a statement about sizes uh, and, and scales. If you're interested in, in understanding how, what is the 
um, expansion rate of the universe and why the universe is expanding with a certain uh, with a certain rates, you're interested in this uh, relative proportion we just discussed is 95% dark um, um, relative uh, proportion of dark versus visible matter. But if you're interested in how structures form in the first place in the universe, uh, or what is the structure of everything that we see out there, uh, then all this 72% of dark energy is almost irrelevant in this case. There is an effect, you know, for those of you who are familiar with the, you know, the growth, um, growth rate of structures, there is a subtle effect of dark energy, but it's certainly not the main effect. Same thing if you look back in the history of the universe, and this is why I, I hope that this conveys why I think it's, it's a bit misleading to say 95% unknown universe. If you look at Big Bang nuclear synthesis, when the first elements were formed, uh, radiation was the, the most abundant um, source of, uh, uh, well, the, the, the relativistic species were the most uh, abundant uh, in the universe. So the universe was made of 45% 45, 45 by neutrinos, 55% of photons. So it was 100% known, right? There was no unknown form of matter and universe. I mean, they were, of course, still there, but you know, completely subdominant compared to the relativistic species. If you look at recombination, when the cosmic microwave background uh, was emitted, this is a bit more technical than the uh, a slide that is a bit more technical than the rest of the talk, but I hope uh, that at least the uh, colleagues uh, will uh, will follow me in this. At recombination, the relative proportion, this was just past matter radiation equality. The universe was 63% dark matter. 12% atoms and the rest still in relativistic species that were being diluted away by the expansion of the universe. Today, is, you know, we recover this 95% dark universe. Tomorrow, if you look further in, in the history, uh, if you think about what will happen in the future of the universe, dark energy will, be, will, uh, will um, dominate completely the uh, matter and energy budget of the universe. So it is okay uh, to say 95% dark universe, but I think we can do better than that uh, when, we, uh, when we explain uh, what's out there, uh, because otherwise it becomes completely uh, incomprehensible for uh, the general audience to understand how we go from a universe that is completely known to a universe that becomes completely uh, uh, unknown uh, after, um, after expanding. Okay, so we, we're coming to the end of, the, uh, uh, of this um, um, description uh, of the universe as, as arranged in nine, in nine spheres because we get to the, um, the size uh, with the sphere number nine, we get to the size of the observable universe. Uh, we get to the point where we observe the lights emitted, uh, the relic light, emitted, uh, released after, uh, after the Big Bang. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about, about all this is that, so these are, this is light that has traveled through the universe for the entire age of the universe. We cannot see past this, um, um, this edge. And this is why we, this is why it's called uh, the observable uh, universe. The actual universe out there is probably much larger than this, and uh, it might be infinite uh, if, uh, if for, for those of you who like to uh, consider the possibility that something like a, a, a infinity might actually be realized in, uh, in nature. Certainly it is much, much larger than the observable universe that we observe. If uh, in the case of constant curvature, uh, we know that it must be larger than 10,000 times the, uh, the size of the universe we observe, at least. Otherwise, we would have seen the, the curvature. How do we make sure that the description of the universe we found is, uh, is accurate and it works? Well, we can uh, put all these ingredients. We can put the, the baryons, the photons, the neutrinos, all the particles we're familiar with, uh, dark matter and dark energy into a computer simulation start to grow a universe from an initial condition that we see imprinted in, the, in something we observe, the cosmic microwave background, and wait and see whether the universe you form is actually similar uh, to the one you observe with your telescopes. 
And what we, what these numerical simulations do now is that they follow not only the formation of these big gravitational clouds where dark matter accumulates, but you can actually follow generation of stars as they form, explodes, injects chemical elements into a universe that was initially uh, composed solely of uh, hydrogen and helium. They enrich the interstellar medium with these uh, heavier and heavier chemical elements. And this provides uh, the, the building blocks uh, for subsequent generations of stars and planets like around them. So these simulations work really very, very well, uh, especially on very large scales. The, the, the frontier now is to, um, to try and resolve in, this, in these simulations, in these numerical simulations, at the same time, what happens on very, very small scales, small compared to cosmological scales on the scale, of what I mean is uh, what happens on the scale of stars and, and planets, at the same time as you resolve the physics that happens on the scale of uh, um, cosmological structures like the clusters of galaxies and so on. And it, when, when you get at this ninth sphere, you reach this, uh, this other mystery, which is the, the very mystery of the existence of our own universe. The Big Bang is the fourth of these uh, four mysteries uh, of the universe that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we, we see this light that is emitted around uh, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. We think we understand the universe um, as early as a few minutes after the Big Bang. And we have probes of the uh, first instance of the universe because it's in the first few minutes that all the um, light elements like hydrogen and helium uh, were formed. So we can measure the abundance of these, uh, of these elements, and this is in agreement with our calculations of the so the hot Big Bang. But we're still struggling to understand what happened at the beginning. We're still trying to uh, assign a specific meaning to the so-called T equals zero, to the initial time from which everything has uh, uh, started. If you put everything together, you get this, uh, this cosmos arranged in, uh, in, nine, uh, um, in nine spheres. And uh, this is what this new picture uh, that uh, cosmology has, um, uh, this new um, idea uh, that cosmology gives us of the universe. Uh, this is something that emerged over the last uh, 100 years, really. Uh, we, we literally did not know that other galaxies existed until uh, um, the uh, 1920s, basically. And then the discovery was in 19, the discovery of an external galaxy. The fact that the Andromeda galaxy was an external galaxy outside the Milky Way, thanks back uh, to the work of, uh, of Hubble, I think it was 1924. So it's less than a century uh, that we are, um, we, we started to become familiar with these other outer spheres uh, of, the, of the cosmos. And it's on, in those spheres that we discover all these mysteries uh, that need to be. Uh, they need to be solved now. And, you know, I connect this to the, uh, I come now to the final part of the talk, which is, you know, what remains to be discovered. Um, we, we discussed about these mysterious forms of matter and energy that, that, that seem to be out there. And we're still trying to figure out what these uh, forms of matter and energy are in the first place. We're trying to find, the, to understand what was the mechanism at the origin of the universe. Uh, there's a mechanism called inflation in particular, the posits that there was this initial field of, uh, of energy, it was called uh, the inflaton. And it was uh, uh, thanks to the inflaton that the universe was, uh, was expanded. And what we see imprinted on the cosmic microwave background, all these uh, small um, inhomogeneities in the distribution of matter that we see imprinted on the cosmic microwave background, which eventually, as we've seen through numerical simulations, gave rise to everything that is out there in the universe, you know, planets and stars and so on. Well, according to the mechanism of inflation, those small inhomogeneities, they arise from quantum fluctuations, you know, these small inhomogeneities that were present in this field of energy uh, that was the, the inflaton in the very first instance of the uh, of existence of the of the universe. 
Now, the, the, the frontier of the astroparticle physics is to try and find a fundamental um, understanding of, to come up with a fundamental understanding of all these, uh, of all these mysteries. We would like ideally to find uh, the particles that make up the dark matter, if it is made of, of particles, we're not even sure of that. Uh, we would like to understand the mechanism behind the dark energy, whether it's really made in a form of energy which is out there, or maybe a cosmological constant, a concept that Einstein had postulated uh, already a century ago. We would like to understand the mechanism behind um, the uh, origin of the universe. And we would like to understand also what are the connections between uh, what happens in black holes, which is where general relativity, these big macroscopic objects, meets quantum physics. You know, at some point, uh, in, these, uh, in these objects, formally, you would, uh, you would form objects of infinite density. You would have to concentrate an infinite density uh, in, um, in, um, um, at a point of uh, an infinitely small point. You know, it's, 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 it's something completely absurd that defies every law we know in, um, in physics. And we know that at some point we need to evoke, uh, to invoke quantum physics if we want to explain what happens inside black holes, but also around black holes, around the so-called event horizon of black holes. And we come down, we come now to the final um, uh, connection that, 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 that I wanted to elaborate on, the fact that the physics of the infinitely large will happen on very large scales might, um, the, the, the origin of all these problems might sink their roots into the infinitely small in all of these, uh, of these four cases. Now, I don't have time to do the, the full reverse uh, travel down, downwards, so to say, to uh, starting from the scale of, um, of humans all the way to smaller and smaller scales. Let me just do two jumps. Uh, by a factor of a billion. So we start from the scale of, uh, of humans and then we go on a scale of uh, a billionth uh, of a meter. And uh, on these scales, you see, this is the size of the uh, DNA molecules. If you jump another, uh, by another factor of uh, a billion, you can actually resolve the interior of uh, atomic nuclei. Okay, you can actually see what's in the nucleus uh, the, 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 the quarks uh, that are uh, inside the nucleus and the way they're bound together by, uh, by the so-called gluons. Okay, so to understand all, all this, um, and I connect this to what I was saying at the beginning, so the, the, what I've said so far is that we have found a new um, sense we have developed a new sense uh, to understand the universe and to probe the deep universe, which is gravitational waves. Then I moved on and I said, look, there's a big universe uh, out there and there are many mysteries that we have um, encountered in our exploration of the universe with our telescopes. Now I want to connect these two pieces of, of information that I provided, the first direct detection of, the, of gravitational waves with this idea that there are new mysteries and uh, I would like, I want to argue that gravitational waves might be the key to solve these, uh, to the, to these mysteries. Okay, so we have developed this new sense. We want to use this new sense to establish these connections between infinitely large and infinitely small, to establish the, this connection between these two infinities. Now, we'd have to, to provide some technical details to elaborate uh, for each of these different mysteries, how we could uh, uh, try and do that. Let me do this at the you know, highest possible level, uh, just mentioning what these possible connections are. And then I will give you one explicit example uh, of how gravitational waves might elucidate the nature of dark matter. Then I will close the presentation and uh, you, you can ask, uh, um, you should feel free to ask questions. We can go a bit more in depth in any of the uh, of the problems uh, here that are shown in this um, in this slide. Now, in the case of dark matter, we might figure out whether it's made of uh, of new particles, and uh, and I will show you in a minute how we could uh, hope to do that with gravitational waves. In the case of dark energy, we could uh, 
try and understand whether what is pushing the universe, what is making the universe expand ever faster is actually a form of, uh, of energy, a dynamical form of energy that evolves in the universe, or whether it's something that remains constant throughout the history of the universe. And the way we could do this is that gravitational waves provide an independent way of measuring the expansion rates of the universe. And so we could figure out, uh, we, we could solve some of the problems that we currently have, they currently have in cosmology, in particular, trying to figure out whether there is a discrepancy between the different methods that we have uh, for measuring the expansion rate of the universe. And for those of you who are, uh, for the experts in, um, in the Zoom room, uh, this is connected to so-called the Hubble trouble, you know, the, the, the measurement of the Hubble constant. Hubble parameter, I should say. Um, we might figure out uh, the mechanism that was um, in place in the early universe, because one of the predictions of, uh, of inflations is that there could be a, um, a background of gravitational waves that are emitted during the uh, accelerated expansion that gave rise to um, the characterized the very first instance of the uh, existence of the universe. So the search for gravitational waves from inflation is one of the uh, great frontiers of, the, uh, of cosmology. And finally, we might uh, explore the connections between macroscopic and microscopic scales around, around black holes, by searching for quantum effects around black holes, by looking carefully at the waveforms emitted by black holes, uh, by two black holes as they merge with each other. There are many quantum effects they could pick it up by studying very carefully uh, the waveform uh, of these uh, as these are these compact objects merge with each other. Before closing, I wanted to, to show you one explicit example of how we could use gravitational waves. Uh, for do, do I have one minute to show this example, Martin? Or would you like me to close uh, now? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, after that, we, we go to the questions, right? Perfect, yeah. So I wanted to show you an example because this is something we are currently doing uh, at the University of, of Amsterdam in, um, uh, in my group. Uh, these are two former postdocs, Bradley Kavanagh, who's now uh, in um, uh, Spain, um, and uh, Daniele Gaggero, uh, who's, just, um, uh, who's also, as a matter of fact, in Spain, a tenure track in, uh, in Valencia. Bradley is in Santander. Daniela is a tenure track in Valencia now. Now, what we've studied here is what happens when instead of having two black holes that merge with each other, you dress these black holes with dark matter particles. Okay, so these are black holes surrounded by dark matter. And in many scenarios, actually, you expect these black holes to carry a dark matter dress with them because they always form at the center of very dense configurations of dark matter. So if you look at the evolution of this uh, the system, you see these two black holes coming together, approaching each other as they would if they were naked black holes without any dark matter dress. But then the interaction, the gravitational interaction between these two clouds of dark matter dramatically affects the evolution of the binary. You see that you start from a very long, elongate, very elongated and large orbit uh, you shrink the orbit enormously because the binary, some of the, bi uh, the energy of the binary is transferred to the particles, to the dark matter particles surrounding these, uh, this system. And, um, and so there are two main effects. One is that you reduce the um, separation between these two objects, you shrink the orbits. And uh, the other effect is that you circularize the orbit. They become less and less elliptical and closer and closer to circular in this case. So by looking at the gravitational waveform, the gravitational waveform tells you a lot uh, about, gravitational waveform is what you measure on Earth with these gravitational interferometers. If you study that carefully, you can search for the signature of these uh, dark matter particles around the black holes. It can actually, actually help to detect the specific signature that different dark matter particles have on the dark matter waveform. So this is a new frontier. We still have a, quite a lot of work to do to understand these systems uh, in detail, 
but we're making good progress. And, um, and I hope that with the, the next generation of um, uh, interferometers, the, the Einstein telescope, or, uh, which might actually be built in, um, uh, in the Netherlands, if all goes well, um, or with LISA, the space interferometer, we will be able to address uh, these, um, these type of questions. Okay, so I conclude here. Um, how big is the universe? I promise that we'll try to address this, these four different questions. How big is the universe? Well, it's, uh, it's very big and we, we've seen uh, uh, what are the relative sizes of things that are there. Uh, what is it made of? 95% dark, uh, but I, I think this is a statement that needs to be qualified uh, when we talk, especially when we talk to a general public, because otherwise, otherwise it can be quite misleading. What remains to be discovered? Clearly a lot. And where do we stand between two infinities? All right. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Well, thank you, Gianfranco, for this excellent talk. Uh, I think this was more or less a masterclass in explaining physics and cosmology, et cetera, to a large audience. Uh, so um, masterful, and thank you. Um, I'm quite sure there's some questions from the audience. Um, so um, if you like, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and announce your question. Do it on camera. Who can I give the floor for a question? Stan? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, um... So Franco, thank you. Very nice uh, presentation. And I think this is uh, really a spot on topic uh, where, where the future of, uh, of uh, physics lies to my mind. Um, what I seem to somehow miss in your, in your, um, uh, in your discussion of the uh, elementary side of things is the discovery of the Higgs particle. And, mm -hmm. Uh, the Higgs, the, the Higgs field, uh, the conceptual problems that we have with that. And I think that is an excellent motivation also for that side of the coin to, uh, to a dark matter component. So uh, did you elaborate that in your, in your book? No, so I discussed this a bit more in my, in my previous uh, book. Um, I have thought initially about adding something uh, but the discussion had become quite uh, technical. The, so one way I think, I, I'll think a bit more about that, uh, Stan, maybe for, also for next presentation. I think one way where this could enter the discussion is uh, through uh, the discussion of um, phase transitions in the early universe. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so th that's something that might find a way. It's a bit more difficult to convey to a general uh, audience, but I think it would be a, an interesting challenge uh, to try and explain the role of the Higgs in particle physics and uh, connect to phase transitions and then to gravitational waves. It's a, it's a good suggestion, I keep that in mind. Uh, understandably, uh, you, you realize that uh, I enjoy the way that you put the uh, central topic on gravitational waves, which we are dealing a lot with also at our institute indeed. Exactly, yeah. Nice. Any any other questions from the audience? Stan, if you like, you can mute, please. Maybe I can ask a question. It's just yeah, from my own understanding. Uh, John Franco, you said that at Big Bang nucleosynthesis, basically the the universe's radiation dominated. Mm -hmm. Is that like always true, independent of what dark matter is? Even if there's some sort of like a like. Um, warm dark matter or something. I understand this is not for this audience, but just for my own understanding. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, I think actually you can use, uh, because you know, Big Bang nuclear synthesis constrains uh, quite well uh, the so-called baryon to photon ratio. This is, yeah, quite quite technical for, for this audience, but you can constrain, actually what people do is, is do it the other way around. They use the fact that there's an excellent agreement between the nuclear synthesis and current observations to set constraints on dark matter. So we know, for example, that you cannot add relativistic degrees of freedom, otherwise this would uh, ruin the agreement between predictions and data. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes left, so any other questions? Beatrice, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Love well, it. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I would like to to tell Gianfranco that 
uh, the values that you are using for the densities of uh, dark energy and dark matter and atoms and so are the ones given by W map. But uh, in 2013 and again in 2018, the, solid, uh, the, the project Planck, no? the satellite Planck, gave quite different values. So I think you should update these values because their matter uh, seems to be almost 27% now, 26, a bit more than 26%, and dark energy is a bit more, 68%, a bit more, and atoms is 4%. So it's already, these values are already uh, from 2013. So it's already- Yeah, I think I took- eight years uh, ago. No, yeah, I think I took the, the Planck data, but you know, if you look at the Planck table, there are many, many different values depending on what are the, the priors you assume and the experiments you include in the counts. So you have uh, the data that are for Planck alone. Then there are the then there is Planck plus baryonic acoustic oscillations, then Planck plus baryonic acoustic oscillations plus supernovae, and so on. So it depends a little bit on the on the specific choices that you make. But what I what I'll do is maybe Beatrice, I think it's uh, uh, I, for for a technical audience, maybe I'll specify what data uh, I, I I use and what I refer specifically to. Thanks. Okay. And, the, and then again, the point you were trying to make, I guess, was that this all these uh, numbers depend on uh, both the scale you're looking at and the, the timing uh, connected to the Big Bang. Exactly, and that's that's really the, the crucial point, I think, because it's it can be very confusing. You know, I had a number of discussions with um, you know people who are not experts in the field. And they get very confused when we say, you, you know, uh, ninety-five percent. Okay, so also the galaxy contains a lot of dark energy. No, it doesn't. Um, so, uh, and then we say, um, you know, in the early universe we know that the universe was dominated. Uh, but why do you say that when you just say that ninety-five percent of the universe is dark? It can be a cause of a lot of uh, of confusion. So I, I think we need to be a bit careful when we when we use that uh, when we, we express that that concept actually. Yes. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, who, who will do the final question? Anyone? Bauke, go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the talk. I was actually very interested by this final uh, simulation that you showed. And I understand how it can sort of, from the waveform, you can sort of tell something about the, maybe the amount of dark matter that was involved in this gravitational inflow. But can you also use it to tell something about the nature of dark matter or how, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what, a, what information can we extract from it? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, yes, uh, and this is exactly what we're trying to, uh, to figure out these days. I'll give you uh, two examples of uh, uh, dark matter candidates that we could, be able to discriminate by looking at the waveform. Now, in the simulation you've seen, uh, we just made a very simple assumption uh, for the nature of dark matter. We just assume that it's cold and collisionless. It doesn't interact with itself, doesn't interact with anything else. And the velocity dispersion is uh, completely negligible. It's zero, essentially. Now, there are, I'll, I'll give you two examples of things that do not behave this way. Suppose that, as our friends in um, theoretical physics like to, to do, that dark matter is not made of cold collisionless particles, but they are ultralight particles, you know, with a mass of 10 to the minus 20 electron volts. So the wavelength associated to these particles is, compare, it is comparable with the size of the black hole itself. And there's a very rich physics that has been studied for, for decades now, you know, things like super radiance you might have heard uh, and other processes that happen around black holes in that case, they create over densities of this dark matter, or this dark matter field around black holes in systems that are called gravitational atoms, right? They have field configurations, like you have electron orbitals around the nucleus, you have field configurations of this dark matter candidate around black holes. Now, in that case, you also have effects like uh, dynamical friction and accretion and other things that modify the waveform, but these effects are very different with respect to the case of uh, collisionless dark matter. So we are trying to compare 
the defacing induced in, the, in these two different systems by these two different types of, uh, of dark matter uh, to, to try and see whether we can discriminate the two systems. We, we will see that there is an additional effect, an additional energy loss in these systems. And we think we can actually tell which system is responsible for these additional energy losses. Final example I wanted to make, if you start to increase the velocity dispersion, if dark matter is not cold, but it's warm, or if it is self-annihilating, the way it is distributed around the black hole will be different. So if you look at how the energy loss behaves as a function of time, as you go closer and closer to the black hole, you might be able to tell the difference between these two different cases. OK, thank you very much. OK, thank you, Gianfranco, again. And thank you, uh, all others, um, posing questions and raising issues. Um,